You're listening to the Sketchnote Army Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Rohde, the author of the Sketchnote Handbook and the Sketchnote Workbook. And this is the podcast where I chat with sketchnoters and visual thinkers and try to understand what makes them tick. Hey, are you looking for the ideal sketchbook for your sketchnoting practice? The Sketchnote Idea Book is the sketchbook designed for sketchnoters. Equipped with no bleed, no show through paper, you can take almost any marker or pen you can throw at it. Get 10% off with code ARMY at airship.store. Hey everyone, it's Mike and I'm here with Deb Aoki. Deb, it's so good to have you on the show. Oh, thank you, Mike. It's good to see you. You too. We, um, Deb and I have been kind of bouncing into each other on the interwebs for a while and eventually... We met each other in Paris, of all places. Good place to meet somebody um, mm-hmm. at the International Sketchnote Camp in Paris in 2019, which I was thinking about that today. That's pre-pandemic. So that was like yes. the world before, the before times. So really different That's true. mindset and everything a little bit. Um, but anyway, so Deb uh, is just a multi-talented person, and we're going to talk with her about who she is and her journey and sort of uh, get some lessons from her as well and chit chat about all kinds of stuff, I'm sure. So let's start out, Deb, with tell us who you are, what you do, and then how did you get here? What's your origin story from when you were a little girl to like this moment? Oh, gosh. (laughs) Um, Well, I think the the best place to start is I'm originally from Hawaii. Mm. Uh, I grew up, um, I'm a third generation Japanese American. So Mm. I was surrounded by Japanese culture, but um, Mm -hmm. I generally, but I kind of don't speak Japanese fluently. I can read Mm. and speak some. Okay. But, you know, the nice thing about it, but growing up in Hawaii, I was surrounded by things like manga and anime much earlier than a lot Mm. of other people. Mm -hmm. And so the nice part about that is that when you, as a young girl, I got to read a lot of comics for girls from Japan. Ah. And it, what in all those comics, it would kind of give you this sense of, oh, this is uh, the comic artist you love. And here's how to draw like her. Or here's how to, you can be a comic artist too. Hmm. So I got a lot of great tips from that. And, you know, like you have this, it fueled this dream of like becoming an illustrator or comic hmm. artist from a young age. And when I've compared notes with other people, other peers, um, at the same time for American comics, comics for girls were going away. Mm. or almost faded out so i was really lucky in that you know my love of comics came that way and was sustained that way um so i've always loved to draw but you know mm. the comics part is the part where um you know like you, some, sometimes you draw for yourself but with comics i found out early on um you're telling stories and you share those stories with your friends and they're mm. like oh i want to see more i want to see more mm-hmm. so you keep making so, more yeah, so it's it's huh. kind of fun. It's a good way for people who normally don't, you know, like like to talk about themselves. Uh, yeah, be able to kind of put themselves out there. So I want to break in for a minute, minute, and assume there maybe there's somebody who's never heard of manga or anime. Or maybe they've heard them. They're not exactly oh. sure, like what are they and why are they? Are they the same thing? Are they different? And give us sort of a a baseline of that, and then probably the I guess the last thing is obviously. Uh, comic culture, manga, anime culture in Japan is very different than any kind of culture in the U.S. In a lot of ways in the U.S., comics are seen for little kids and they're dismissed where I think in Japan they're revered and it's kind of an art form, right? So talk a little bit about that too. Oh, well, the simplest way to put it is manga is the uh, comics, like, you know, the okay. page, uh, the you know, panels and word balloons. And anime is the animated version. Like Got cartoons. it. Okay. That's easy to remember. Yeah. And so, you know, sometimes there are, a lot of times a lot of the anime is based on the original manga stories, Mm, but there's also anime that is original, like the Miyazaki works are all Mm. original stories created just for that. I see. Because there's no manga that came before it with, with pretty, yeah, in general. So, but uh, I guess the the way to think about it is um, one of my agent friends in Japan explained that the movie industry, the entertainment industry in Japan is not as big as it and well funded as it is mm. here in Hollywood, you know, US. So the their best storytelling talent goes into manga. Really? Like, 
you know, the editors, uh, the writers, the artists, um, and manga artists compared to, say, American comic creators, like a lot of work, work for the big companies. Mm -hmm. And the big companies here, they work as work for hire, meaning mm. if you, you draw a Superman story, you get paid per page, and that's kind of it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's someone else's character. You get to play in that playground, but you didn't create that playground. Mm -hmm. And you don't own that playground. Yeah, no, for sure. Whereas in manga, uh, what they encourage is um, every creator comes up with their own characters and story and world, and they just run with it. And they, from beginning to end, volume one to volume 100, whatever, it is their characters, their story, mm. their vision, and usually their art. So they own it, you know, from beginning to end. So as one of the other key differences is that manga artists, um, while not all of them are super successful, some of them are like top, you know, top tax bracket wow. people <laughs> in Japan. Wow. So the scale of the business is so different. And mm. uh, and that manga is for everybody. There's manga for kids, manga for, you know, business people, manga for housewives, manga that explains how to, you know, manage your money or mm. run business. <laughs> A manga wow. about uh, dealing with parents with Alzheimer's, manga of, you know, silly manga, funny, you know, serious manga, stuff. historical mm -hmm. manga. So it's, I tell people it's like manga is, is like movies. It's just mm. a, a, a way to tell stories and what kind of stories can be almost anything. Mm. That's really fascinating. And I love that it's so diverse. And, it's fun. You know, it, it's almost like a whole publishing. It's like we think about uh, paperback books or nonfiction all wrapped up that's the same thing except it's visualized and the oh, yeah. creators own it in some sense actually i want to enter that too because one of the things that i found is that I, I i teach classes in drawing for business people and i've done this in us india and japan mm -hmm. and the thing that i found fascinating is the people i taught in japan were so visually literate mm -hmm. <laughs> like from the get-go uh, i almost didn't have to teach them much at all Mm. Where uh, the Indian one, the people I teach anywhere maybe second, but the people I teach in North America seem to be maybe the least <laughs> yeah. comfortable. It's sort of resistance in a way, right? Yeah, resistance mm. to that visualization, which yeah, which is I guess the sketch noting opportunity sort of brings that to them, but it's more of an opportunity in some ways, huh? Well, I've sort of yeah, derailed you with that, but I thought it might be helpful for someone who's not, who maybe is not into that to know, like, they've heard those words, but what do they mean? And it's kind of nice to have some context into oh, sure. how you grew up. And so now you understand that culture, that very visual culture that Deb sort of grew up in. So let's continue with your story. So you're a little girl, you're surrounded by this manga and probably anime. Mm. And then how did that influence you? And like, were there big moments where you had to make choices where you kind of went with the flow and you ended up in a place like, hey, look where I ended up. Yeah, I guess that's kind of weird because, mm, like, uh, I, I, I started drawing comics. Uh, I used to just draw comics for myself and for my friends. Mm -hmm. And then I moved from I from uh, Hawaii. Then I moved to the New York. Uh, went to art school for a little bit. And I would write home letters to my mom, and I would have little drawings of the things that I would see, like the things that people would say to me, like, oh, you're from Hawaii, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> or, like, and they would all – or things I would run into like, oh my God, I can't find, you know, Japanese rice at the supermarket or mm. wow, spam is so expensive here. <laughs> you know, all these things that I draw, write letters and draw pictures for my mom. And then when I came back to Hawaii to finish my college education, um, I realized that, you know, it's, you know, taking a passive approach to my education, like just going to, going to a lecture, do the homework, come home. I realized, oh, actually, there's all kinds of other opportunities at college that I could take advantage of. Mm. So I went to the school newspaper and I said, hey, I'd like to draw a comic strip. Mm -hmm. And they said, sure. So that was good in that I got, you know, uh, an experience having to draw three times a week, something, mm -hmm. right? And then getting people's feedback, people saying, oh, I love this, or I didn't get that joke, or, mm. oh, that's, um, so that was a change. And then I met all these people who were in the journalism department. Then, so I went to school for art. I mean, I went, did printmaking and whatever. Mm. And then, so one of the extracurricular activities I did was run the campus um, art gallery. So I had to learn how to write press releases. And, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So writing, yeah. Do, doing promotions, making posters, and mm -hmm. getting people to, 
you know, writing up paperwork to get people to be in the show and describe the show. So all of that led to, after I graduated college, to me doing uh, PR for art galleries, for my mm. friend's art galleries. Interesting. Which, which then led to me writing for the newspaper, uh, art reviews, music mm. reviews. I did a comic strip. Um, like I said, it was, and a lot of the, my people who recommended me were people I went to school with in the journalism department at, at University mm. of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So everything was kind of like, I would make it public what I did or what I was interested in. Most, and then people would connect the dots. Like, mm. oh, how about, they would say, oh, Deb, you'd like to write, how about this? Oh, Deb, you know, you draw a cartoon. Would you like to draw your cartoon here? So it was all kind of making it visible to others. So I would run it to people, other artists and other cartoonists who would kind of, you know, I mean, this is your 20s, right? You're competitive. Yeah, and, yeah. So, and they're like, how come you get all these opportunities? <laughs> ah. And it's like, oh, that's because I put my sign out by the side of the road that said, hi, I do this. And people saw it and would say, oh, I have this opportunity. I have this opportunity. Why don't you? But if you're just sitting in your room drawing your comics and yeah. waiting for someone to knock on your door, to discover you, that won't happen. <laughs> yeah, it could <laughs> right? happen. And this yeah. is before the internet, right? Where you can yeah. put stuff on Instagram and whatever. So it's and that was one of the key lessons. And then hmm. the journalist having a journalism background, you know, learning about how to write a news story and do good interviews, ask questions, and mm -hmm. be curious. So that when I did finally move to New York, to the mainland, I got uh, work doing writing, mm. you know, more like I would, I was like an admin assistant at a game company. Okay. Or I said, I was a temp at an ad agency. <laughs> and so that gets, then it kind of led to, I moved to Seattle and this was at the time, it's like, mm, nine, I'd say late nineties. Right at the grunge music period just, just yeah. started to happen, right? So then I got a job at Microsoft working at MSN, where a lot of ah. other former journalists were working. Okay. So, so I wrote headlines for the news, for the homepage, um, all kinds of stuff like that. I did uh, you know, case studies for SQL Server. <laughs> wow. <laughs> a lot of writing. Um, huh. So that's when my, my path diverged a little bit, right? Where... Most of my career, most of the tech career was in writing, content writing, UX writing. And then my drawing was some was kind of a, you know, something fun I did on the side. Mm -hmm. And then where it all converged later was when I worked at eBay. And I would be in these meetings, you know, having to write, you know, a copy for different apps or different features. And then they would explain stuff and I'd like, um, you know, that explains that from a technical point of view or from a business goal point of view. And I was like, uh, I have to write for what the user is going to do, what the right. user is going to see. Got to translate. <laughs> so then I would just at a certain point go, this is not, I'm not understanding or you're not giving me the information I need. Mm -hmm. So I would grab a pen and just go up to the whiteboard and go, okay, so user comes here, clicks this, comes here, does this, sends an email, da, 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 like all this stuff. And then, and then what happens here? <laughs> Yeah. Or then, or or then, what happens when there's an error, or they fill out something wrong, or yeah, magic stuff. goes and here. <laughs> and then sometimes they would, I would say, do they do this? Then the the product, sometimes the product manager would go like, yes, exactly, that's how that works. And then an engineer from the back who normally wouldn't speak would say, no, actually that won't work that way. <laughs> and actually, no, um, that's impossible. And wait, what? what and it would turn to the product manager guys, no. The database won't do this and blah, 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 blah. What are you talking about? Yeah. You're making so, assumptions. Yeah. So I kind of got into this. So I kind of got, I don't know, some kind of small degree of notoriety for that. Like a facilitator. <laughs> you'd facilitate these discussions, right? Yeah. Like you'd go, oh, you know, depth, depth draws. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. It came out. Then what Then what led, led to is I had a, a colleague in the user research department who was saying, your skills are perfect for what we need. Mm. So she would bring me into workshops uh, where they were coming up with, uh, they were trying to come up with new features and they would say, oh, I want it 
can you draw storyboards that show mm. how people are using this or might use this? Can you draw personas, you know, like who the customer is? So from that, then I got the magical thing is I started getting invited to meetings earlier mm. in the design yeah. process. Because they wanted you to help them to guide you, to guide yeah. them, right? And I got involved with business strategy earlier. I got involved with, you know, under, doing coming along on user research type projects where I'd get to know who the users were by listening to them and, you know, observing them. So this all like for content people, content strategists in UX design, if designers complain about being, having no, not having a seat at the table mm -hmm. or not getting respect, content designers are even lower than that. <laughs> You know what right, because I mean? nobody like, thinks of content till the thing's about to launch, right? That was always correct. my experience. All of the lorem ipsums, right? And then yeah. it would just be blank placeholder copy or, oh, we'll fill that in later. And then it would come to me. And, and later go, would come, yeah. <laughs> and I'd go, ah, oh, wait, why do you have this step before this step? And why, you know, what, do we need this extra page and all that stuff? And I bring up these things and people would say, well, Deb, those are excellent points. But it's too late. We've built it already. So can you write around it? <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> so, you know, so that was when I've given this talk, when I've given talk about my drawing to content strategists, I tell them, this is your little tool to get in the room earlier and to get mm. your, and for you to inject the per point of view of the user. Because if it's like, oh, hi, I'm the content strategist. And here, if this is my opinion, you tend to not get listened to as much as. Right. You do back up. Here's what users going through. And then you show these pictures and then they imagine, they go, oh, oh. if I, you know, they, they can put themselves in the space of that user and go like, oh, that would suck, huh? <laughs> yeah. Oh, we have, to, we have to change that. It puts the burden so, back on them and not on you, right? It's not your opinion. It's the user having this issue. Oh, how are you going right. to solve it? So that's, I guess since then, it's, I've been discovering this intersection of the visual storytelling and the, what the difference it makes. Mm -hmm. in these types of situations and you know being able to inject humanity into our product design decisions mm. which tends to get lost sometimes surprisingly mm. that could be a good uh encouragement for people that are listening who are maybe in non like they like visual thinking but they are trying to find a way to integrate it into their daily life being the person oh. who draws things is a huge opportunity anybody can do it really in any position Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it, and it doesn't have to be fancy. Mm. I, I've, I've had several colleagues that do very simple storyboards and seen it make huge differences in product direction mm -hmm. or e product implementation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could be a CPA that draws, right? Who you can visualize, oh, yeah. you know, numeric stuff in a way that people understand it better. That's a huge value. What's so. the guy, uh, there's a famous econo economist at Berkeley. He, he does a lot of drawings. <laughs> hmm. um, is I'm that uh, this his name Larry something? No, I'm trying um, to think. It'll come to it'll come to us as soon as we yeah, stop recording. <laughs> I'll remember it, but a bit, it's interesting because he does a lot of whiteboard drawing with pictures, uh -huh. and so Fantagraphics, which is a comic publisher, they publish uh, uh, I don't know, like Love and Rockets and Daniel Clouds' comics. Published a book of his whiteboard drawings. Really, about economics. They're fabulous. Wow. Well, that's pretty cool. We'll have to we'll have to see if we can find the name of that book and we'll include it in the show notes so we can I'll check it out. Mm. So is that so it sounds like you, the work that you're doing is a lot like this, but I think you you mentioned that you recently have become independent. So tell us a little bit about, you know, moving from um being employed in large companies or small companies and then shifting to being a contractor and a freelancer. How does that change and how does your Deb the person who draws kind of uh, reputation. How has that helped you in that regard? I guess it's, you know, it's been tricky for me, um, partly because uh, my mix of skills makes me, makes it such that there isn't ever a job for me that asks for that, right? Mm. <laughs> um, I usually get in as a content strategist and they find that I can draw and that's a bonus. It's kind of like getting, it. yeah. cracking the egg and you get two yolks. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and then but the stuff I was really enjoying was the drawing stuff but there is almost no job like that mm. like uh, specifically that right so what I've been 
since, uh, you know, as we were talking earlier, that there's been a lot of tech layoffs lately in, mm-hmm. this, in uh, Silicon Valley, where I, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. So with the last round of layoffs that I had to, that I went through, it's gotten harder and harder to find another, the next job lately. And in the interim, I've been doing more consulting work or more like one-off things. Um, it's like things like I teach what I call simple sketching for user experiences mm-hmm. or storyboarding to various tech companies uh, as on a consulting basis. I do it through a company called Tangible UX. Mm. Um, so we teach, uh, so I've done that. Mm-hmm. And then I've done things like I did uh, picture books for Juniper Networks to explain network computing and network security and AI. So that was fun. Uh, I get little interesting challenges. Mm. But the other thing that has happened lately that has brought me back full circle is that manga now is the number three best-selling com- book category in North America. Wow, wow. <laughs> Since the pandemic, um, you know, people started staying home and binging anime on Netflix. And mm-hmm. then that led to people buying more manga. And yeah. Manga sales quadrupled in the last two years. Wow. So it's been discovered in some sense by the West in a way that it hadn't been in the past. I know it's been around. I've seen it around for a long time, but it's kind of a niche, you know, thing. Yeah. So now it's gotten super. And then another, there's a live action One Piece store, uh, TV series on Netflix that was super successful. So all of a yeah. sudden, people are paying attention to manga. Mm-hmm. So over the last six months or so, I've gotten a lot of. A lot of people reaching out to me wanting me to explain manga to them. Yeah. Or, you know, to um like I'm working with a company to make their their online manga app and website more sticky and more oh, engaging. Yeah. So that's a UX thing. But I've also been working with um I have a podcast myself mm-hmm. called Manga Splaining. And <laughs> one of our it's basically four friends. And one of my friends, one of my friends, his name is Chip Zdarsky. He is a comic book creator. So he writes Daredevil and Batman. Wow. And so he's a very much a Western comics guy. Mm -hmm. And during the pandemic, he said, what's this? Uh, Before the pandemic, we all went to Japan together. And then we all dragged him around to all these manga places. (laughs) And he was like, what? What is this? And like, oh, my God, there's so much of it. And oh, my God, I feel so small, you know? (laughs) And so... When we came back after, and the pandemic started, we started this weekly book club for him mm. where we would introduce him to manga one book at a time. <laughs> he would go through it and give his explanations or his re- reflections on it, I guess. Yeah. And he would sometimes pick up on Ask things questions. that surprised us completely. Mm. Like, wait, what? Or he would um, respond to things that we wouldn't expect. Like, you know, like there's a manga called Akira, which almost everybody knows. It's a, hu- it's a big epic sci-fi dystopian mm-hmm. Nikita, yeah. But then we thought, oh, no brainer. He'll love this. But then he ended up liking the really slice of life stuff. Like one of his favorites was um, Way of the House Husband, which is about a, <laughs> a Yakuza hitman who uh, retires and becomes a house husband for his wife who works in marketing mm-hmm. <laughs> and all the things he goes through to, you know, cook and clean prep, and prep the dinner. And, yeah. Yeah. And deal with his mischievous cats and the nosy neighbors. And, <laughs> It's really funny. So um, it's been a delight to, um, you know, have this converse, have this with him. Hmm. And then we started publishing some manga. Like we published a book called Okinawa by Susumu Higa. And it's um, a bunch of short stories about Okinawa before, during, and after the war, but from hmm. a very human point of view. Mm-hmm. And it's really interesting. I mean, I'm, I have, I'm half Okinawa myself, okay. but I've never been to Okinawa. <laughs> so... Hmm. That's been really rewarding. The book came out this fall, and we it's been on a bunch of short lists for wow. books over the past couple, you know, from you know, like even the Washington Post and things like that. Wow, uh, won a couple of awards. So that's you know, like that's been really neat. And then the other thing that came up is um, I'm now teaching uh once a week at California College of Art. Okay, I'm teaching a class on um, manga creation and content in context and creation, history, context and creation for their master of fine art and comics. So what's been interesting with that is that I have to use my facilitation and design sprint mm, training. Everything. Yeah. 
um, to try to come up with exercises for these students to help them, you know, understand how to think how uh, manga creators think about story and character mm -hmm. and page layout. Because these are all things I've learned, I feel instinctively. Right. <laughs> how do you I'm, how do you just describe them? Yeah. Right. Because so kind of like when you did the sketch you note know, handbook, right? This, it was something you were doing. And yeah, right. You were you were doing and you know, trial by error. And but then when you have to write a book, you have to explain it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, you that, was, that was that was interesting. Step, right? How is that for you, by the way? I mean, it, yeah. I mean it's a lot like what you're talking about. It was like, well, I've been doing this for a long time. Like, how do I, I you know, it's really funny is I'm, I'm always been a writer in addition mm -hmm. to a visualizer. So I kind of wrote the whole thing first. Like for oh. me, it sort of worked in my head and I wrote it as a, as a script, wrote oh. it all out. And then I, once I saw like, I let the, the words pour out, then I could say, oh, okay, I could see that visually would look like this. And I could use that sample mm -hmm. here. And I started like bringing all the visual in and then melding it together so it sort of started the backbone was words mm. and then i added images into it to make it to make it happen so that seemed to work well for me and that worked on both both of Burke's books worked the similar way where i wrote the script first um, amazing it, and it was so amazing because i remember the book first came out and seeing how people just so resonated with it right? yeah and so wanted to learn more and like and it's led to so many things for you so that's so exciting to see yeah, and it's in a weird place where it's. I guess it's sort of like a manga. I guess. I mean, it's not. It's not mm. technically manga, but I mean, sort of explaining myself in not frames of a comic book, but it's not so far away. I mean, if you look at it, it's yeah, it's visualization and words, and you know, I'm a huge comic fan from when I was a kid. Huge Daredevil fan, Spider Man, mm. and and so you know that had a huge influence on me and the way I looked at things and the way I framed things comes Absolutely. from that. So there's you know. There's some universal stuff there, and then there's, I'm sure, variation between Western and Eastern comics in the way, think, which is probably part of what you're teaching, right? I suppose. A little bit. Yeah, but there's a lot of commonalities. Yeah, I think so. A lot of it's human, right? It's, so it's human stories, which the beginning, middle, middle, and end, there's conflict, there's resolution. Those common things exist inside the story. Then it's mm -hmm. maybe more the details of expression that change a little bit. So... That's, That's really fascinating kind of for me, you know, because yeah. it's when you're when you because all of these worlds for me, they seem different and I meet different people within them. <laughs> you know, the comics people I meet are different than my the UX design people that I meet, than the journalism people that I meet, that the people from the Japanese culture that I meet. But what's fun about being in all these different worlds is sometimes is seeing where the, the common threads are. Yeah. And then and then applying things you see and observe in one world and applying it in another um like some of the user some of the you know the like user re user experience design and innovation you're dealing with people with people and products that sometimes uh the mar the world is changing around them and they mm -hmm. either resist or they accept and they evolve mm -hmm. so for example the, you know like the the kodak example right the mm -hmm. film company the film co developing company and they had a digital cam option to make a digital camera at some point and then they refused because they didn't want to kill their film business yeah right so i see that happening with comics now so comics mm. it, the, the pamphlet comics is an old style um of reading and consuming comics that started with newsstands but now they're only specialty comic shops so you can find them but manga has been succeeding because manga is in a little book format can be sold mm. at any bookstore. I see. So I, I see manga at Target. <laughs> I see manga at Barnes and Noble, and it reaches. So that's part of why it's, you know, kind of overtaking it. The friction then, is sort of not the same. Not the same, and the it's cheaper. Like you can buy a whole mm -hmm. volume of manga, with two hundred something pages for like ten dollars, mm. and then you'll get you'll get a thirty, uh, page full color comic for six dollars. Yeah. So like all these. And then I see like what's happening with scrolling comics now, where mm. it's designed for, scro for a screen. scrolling. Yeah. And even two page comics don't work that well. So there's all kinds of, I guess, being in this, being an observer in this, uh, this industry and seeing the struggles they're going through, uh, the transitions that's happening, and some of it's relating to customers, right? <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. uh, their reading habits, the devices they're reading on, the stories they want to read, making easy entry points. Like if you want to start with Spider-Man, where do you start? And why Spider-Man looks so different now than he did in the movies? Doesn't mm. align. But like with One Piece, it's just the big pirate comic. It's like 100 something volumes now. If you want to get started, read volume one. Keep going to volume 108. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it is the same as in the TV as in the anime. So, mm. you know, so it's it's the kind of thing where I look at it and go, oh, it's a it's a user it's a, it's a usability problem. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> and and most people in the American comics business are kind of forgive me they I love them, but some of them who are kind of in that Kodak film moment. Yeah, they're kind of trapped in some ways, trapped in yeah, amber in a way. They're a little frightened by what's yeah. come, what's to come. Yeah. So like, hmm. yeah, so it's fun. It's interesting to observe. And see it through that lens. Hmm. I would think that American and I guess Western comic makers, mm -hmm. now that we're really off on a tangent, um, <laughs> they, they must really be seeing what the success of manga, they must know the stats and that why it's working. Are they just writing it off? Oh, that's just a Japanese culture thing. That's why it's popular. But I think what we're seeing is it's coming to the West and it's popular. And mm -hmm. there, there are probably user experience reasons why? Like you sort of cited some, like it's a, it's a pocket book that I could carry. It's about the size of a paperback. It doesn't look out of place. It's not a, you know, a newsprint thing that's bigger and I, it's hard for me to fit it any place or, you know, it's and fra the value and... is better. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe yes. I can look at it on my, I have an iPad so I can read all my manga there. Right. It's sort of, and I think that's where maybe they're similar. Right. I, I would guess mm -hmm. Western comics have adapted to, you know, going on digital devices but yeah it, i would guess that eventually they will be forced to look at manga uh, because They're it's successful at... oh they already are yeah <laughs> i mean it's actually some of the and also kids comics too right um a lot of the comics superhero comics has evolved to the point where it's only really targeting um you know men 30 to 50 right yeah and then there's a whole universe of comics for kids where they don't care about Spider-Man or Batman. They mm -hmm. like Dogman or they like Raina Telkemeyer stories. So they're not, yeah, they're not interested in the, the superhero stuff, the way that they're, you know, their uncles and fathers and grandfathers were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's, mm, I, I, you know, I mean, I, 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 like you see comics is really dear to me. And I think visual literacy is so important. Yeah. You know, not just, not just for entertainment like i see how it makes me a better communicator mm -hmm. um you know i tell people that when i draw when i draw visual diagrams i get people's attention yeah because people love watching people draw yeah. <laughs> yeah you know they'll drop they'll like they, it's like seeing magic appear on a screen and then the other part is that it it brings a mood of lightness into the room and fun which most meetings don't have <laughs> mm -hmm. But also, too, it's kind of, um, I think the beings and moons of creativity and, and collaborative, like one of the things I tell when I give like my talk on how to draw for business, I'll say most, I've shown them like, here's my pretty examples. <laughs> here's the finished storyboards. Here's all the stuff. And then I show you, here's, but here's how it usually starts. And I show my super messy, yeah, fast whiteboard drawings that I'm drawing when I'm getting in a room and people are shouting out things at me like, oh, and they do this and oh, they do this. And I just have to draw fast. And I said, oh, the messy is good because the messy says you can participate too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or nothing here is final, right? Yep. I've actually had people actually step up, grab the eraser, wipe away what I drew and draw what they. Which is great. I, That's like what you want. That's like yes. the ideal, right? Exactly. And that's like, that if I drew it pretty and and nice one it would take me too long right but so i wouldn't be at the capture the conversation but the other part is that then people go like oh deb works so hard on that i can't mess with it yeah or it's it's art it and becomes I, rigid yeah and it's like i don't have the right to touch this or mm -hmm. mess with it so the messy invites uh bring lowest le levels yeah. of playing field and says i'm not attached to this emotionally yeah this, this is a tool for us 
to collaborate yeah. <laughs> and communicate. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. And I think in some ways the messy stuff I've been finding, I don't know if it's because I'm getting older or whatever, but like the messy stuff I'm way more attracted to than the fancy. I mean, I, yeah. not that I don't appreciate the pretty stuff or enjoy it, but there's something about like I can see in the way somebody's thinking by the rough sketching mm. they're doing and it's a little bit loose and it just feels more alive in some ways, right? As you as you do versioning of it and make it more tight and more perfect, it sort of becomes rigid and fixed. And I yeah. think that's what's in people's heads too, right? So if you can capture that loose, you know, sketchy nature, there's something attractive about that actually. If it's not, you know, if it's, it's got to be at least <laughs> recognizable. I mean, if it's so messy that you sure. don't know what it is, I mean, that's maybe at the other end of the spectrum, but like mm -hmm. somewhere in the middle is a good, a nice balance to strike if you can. And it's human, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's human and it's has life in it and you can't help but, you know, find that fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Well, that's really cool. It's, it's so fun to hear how you've sort of. I think all the guests that I have, when I when I look, they sort of collect all these experiences and knowledge and, you know, bring them together. And a lot of times later in their careers, as mm. they become to their peak of their career, suddenly they're drawing from all those things, learning how to write, visualization, how do you communicate, how do you convince people, how do you observe, like all those things are coming into one activity and that you're bringing your whole self to that to that situation or that problem. Mm -hmm. And people trust you like, oh, they're going to, this person's going to help me solve it because they're bringing everything they have. So mm -hmm. that's kind of cool to see that, you know, if, if you're in the beginning of your career, the goal is to kind of gather these experiences and don't think about like your love of like manga as a side <laughs> thing that you can't bring into your work experience. You can, that's going to influence. And there could be a valuable place if you are creative about how you think about it, which is kind of what Dev is doing. Yeah, that's been kind of like I've given this talk to university students uh, over the past couple years, like uh, Christina Watke, who um, mm -hmm. she's also an, a, a well-known visual thinker. She teaches uh, HCI, Human Computer Interaction. Right. She was on the show yeah. years ago. I should probably have her back on. You should. She's doing great stuff. Um, they're teaching a game design class over there. Nice. Um, she invites me over once a semester uh, to teach us. Uh, her, one of her classes that mm -hmm. gets into storyboarding. Nice. And um, what's really fun about that is when I talk with a lot of students, the ones that really come up to me afterwards or pepper me with questions are tend to be the tend to be people who come to me like, I draw too. You mean I can bring this into my mm. work? Yeah. Yes, definitely. Or, or like, wow, this, you mean that's valuable? And I go, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fun. That's cool. I, This episode of the Sketchnote Army podcast is brought to you by Concepts, a perfect tool for sketchnoting, available on iOS, Windows, and Android. Concepts' vector-based drawing feature gives you the power to adjust your drawings anytime you like. You can nudge the curve of a line, swap out one brush for another, or change the stroke thickness and color at any stage of your drawing, saving hours and hours of rework. Vectors provide clean, crisp, high resolution output for your sketch notes at any size you need, large or small. Never worry about fuzzy sketch notes again. Concepts is a powerful, flexible tool that's ideal for sketch noting. Search Concepts in your favorite app store to give it a try. So I want to shift a little bit in our discussion towards your favorite tools. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to start with analog first because there's so many analog tools that exist. And you being into manga and anime, you probably have some really great Japanese influence tools that you probably like for your work, which maybe people can explore. Um, so why don't you just un unleash us all the cool tools that you like? Uh, well, some of my favorites are some that are not as easy to find in mm -hmm. um, US, but they are findable. Okay. Um, one is mild mild liner highlighter pens. Mm. These are pastel, light colored highlighter mm. pens that come in a, a wide range of colors, mm -hmm. like soft pink, soft aqua, two shades of gray, a dark mm. gray and a light gray. And that would be white. really useful for sure. Gray. Yeah. And they're uh, water-based pens, so they don't smell. Mm. And they're because they're highlighter pens, they're light enough that you can see uh, words underneath it. I got it. So, 
So like a lot of American highlighter pens are like this fluorescent yellow. Bold, yeah. Too too heavy. In case, in case you're blind or something, right? <laughs> so it's hard to use for a uh, storyboarding. Like when I teach the storyboarding class, I say you need to have at least a gray pen or a lighter mm. color pen. So I'll say uh, if you can't find the gray pen, use those light blue or uh, mm. lavender, and that's a good substitute for the gray. Mm-hmm. But the mild liner paints have a whole spectrum of light colors cool. that you can use for uh, for sketch noting. So you can get those from like there are Japanese companies like Mido, M I A M M A I D O. Uh, there you see in Kinokune stores if you're if you're near one of those Japanese bookstores. Mm. Mido is their stationery section, mm-hmm. and they have a Mido in a box thing where you can get a stationery subscription box. They send you things, huh? And, and they'll send you a new mix of interesting stationery items from Japan every month. Interesting. The other one is jet pens and jet right. Pens. They're one of my favorites. Jet pens are they're, great. Uh, they're a terrific uh, source of these things. So they have that. And then my other one is um, friction pens. Oh, yes. Uh, erasable. Yeah. Erasable. And they have uh, both ballpoint and felt tip pens, different uh, widths. They also have highlighter pens that are erasable. And they're erasable by friction, which is the heat. The heat. Okay, yeah. Of uh, the rubbing. So it's um, when you they have this little hard rubber thing on the end of the pen and it's not when it erases, it's not like American erasers where it's like you rub it and then like all these little crumbs come up. It's just the rubbing creates heat that erases the art. And it kind of evaporates or something it, like that. It just goes invisible. Yeah. Interesting. It, the yeah. It disappears. It's so they have like ballpoint pens too that have they have gray ones too, mm. which is nice. So that's really good for, um, you know, uh, sketching it. I think. So I use those with conjunction with Pigma Micron pens, okay. which are pig- yeah. pigment black pens. Yeah. Or I use Sharpies. Sharpies are permanent markers. Mm-hmm. And because the the highlighters and the friction pens are water-based. And they the, don't interact with The each microns, other. you know, they don't smear. Mm-hmm. That's the main things I use for sketch mm-hmm. notes. I would think and the then, other, isn't the other challenge with friction is because of heat. Like you don't want to leave it in your hot car on a summer afternoon because all your notes will evaporate. And yeah. Also, <laughs> it was also the pen that was included with the Rocket Book, or still is included with Rocket Book. And I yep, remember the yep. very early ones, you would like put it in the microwave, and you could erase all your notes and then start over again with a blank book. Like that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to watch out with that. And actually, I've had the the friction pens, some of the color felt ones for a while, and it does die out. Mm. Like the the pigment somehow dies so out. Dry, so it dries up or something, or it fades. It, then huh. I, when I write with it, all I get is clear. <laughs> I, I'm not sure why, but again, this is like a case where I've had these friction pens maybe for four years mm. and not used them regularly. So it just broke down over time, probably. Yeah, I don't mm. know whether I have to, because you know the the whiteboard marker trick, right? Where you put a string at the end of the whiteboard marker and you whip it over your head. It kind of it moves all the pigment to the tip, right? Yeah, correct. <laughs> so it's a centrifugal force, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's a neat little trick. So um, I've been trying that with that. Mm. Oh, uh, the other one is I um I love Neuland pens. Oh, they're great, yeah. Yeah, the water-based pens because you can refill them. Yep, they're permanent as well. Many of the inks are permanent, especially the all well, these guys here. The I'm showing the yeah the, the black one, pens are permanent. the outliners. Yeah, these are great. And then the white the you can also mix your own colors because they have mm-hmm. the, the the colors little and bulbs ink. you can kind of mix them and they have blank pens. That have like, no, uh, no pint pigment in them, and you can make your own thing. Just you know, it's really fun. Measure your uh, measure in grams the amount of ink you use because you might have to refill that thing if you need a match. Yeah. What about like um, paper and notebooks and stuff like that? Well, I I've been using your sketch notebooks, by the way. On oh, really? Okay. They're really lovely. Um, otherwise, I use um, moleskins. Uh, okay. The th- the thin ones. Okay. Because I I don't like necessarily carrying a big book everywhere I go. Right. Um, the other thing I'll do sometimes is um, uh, other oh Muji, Muji yeah that's a great store. They're Muji's in some great. big cities yeah. New they York City is the one I've been to yeah. One of my favorites is they have these um, uh, notebooks with a brown uh, plain brown paper cardboard cover mm-hmm. with a little elastic around it. Oh to, okay. To keep the to keep the book shut. Yeah, okay. But the brown paper uh, cover is so nice because when you, like, I travel to Japan quite frequently. 
And at a lot of the museums that you go to or the tourist attractions, they'll have a little stamp pad. Ah, Um, and you can they have stamp a little it. a little commemorative stamp where uh, I went to this place. So when I have my little travel journey from Japan, I usually pick up all those books and then every place that has a little stamp pad, I stamp it. Like an art art passport. <laughs> Yeah. There's a um they also have travelers notebooks. Have you heard of those? Yes, I know about the Traveler's Notebooks. Yeah, those are great. The Traveler's Notebooks are really from Japan. Yes. So they have they have traveler notebooks stores just for them. That's so, so, so if you don't know what these are, it's um typically the traditional one is a piece of leather that was cut and folded. So it's like a, like a cover and then there's a string inside of it. And then you get these notebooks and you, and they're staple bound and you slide the notebook into the string and that's what holds it into the leather cover. So you can kind of swap them in. You can stack up more than one and you can kind of make it whatever you like. They have all kinds of inserts too, right? Like plastic things with zips Mm -hmm. you can slide in and like all kinds of crazy stuff that you can add and make the notebook what you like. Mm -hmm. calendar insert calendar Mm -hmm. mini booklets uh grids dots so you can make your own customized notebook that you can slip in things in and out Yeah. it's it's a really nice system and it's basically about the size of a, a looks like a, about the size of an air a little bit bigger than an airline ticket <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's the big one. They also have a, I know that they have a, a passport size one too. It's a little bit shorter. Um, so if you need a pocket, a pocketable thing, you could go in that direction as well. Uh-huh. It's a really nice system. Uh it is not it's because it's from Japan and imported, it's not the cheapest. Uh Right. I think which is cheaper. But on the bright side for all of the people who like Japanese stationery, the yen to dollar exchange rate is the lowest it's ever been Hmm. in about twenty years. Maybe I need to go to jet pens this week. Yes. It's at like 150 yen to the dollar now. Hmm. <laughs> Typically before last year, even it was like closer to 100, 110 yen to a dollar. When you go to Japan, it's like you're getting a 30, 40% discount on This this everything. is the time to book your tickets to Japan, everybody. You should go to Japan. I Oh, and if you do go to Japan, make sure you go to Shinjuku Sanchome because, area, because that's where they have the Sekaido. Sekaido is a five-story art supply store. Oh boy, you'd never It leave is that the, place. it is the best. <laughs> And then at the, otherwise, there's also Tokyo Hands, which has a mix of uh, art supplies and stationery and office stuff and home, like craft things, like all kinds of craft kits. And then there's Loft, which also has a great stationery and gift selection. So it is a stationery lover's dream. I Please bet. go to Japan. Yeah. Spend some money there. <laughs> you definitely will in those stores. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's really cool. I You're reminding me, I have I can see my traveler's notebook right over here. I haven't used it for a while. Kind of encouraging me to maybe get some. So the, what's nice about those is not only can you buy books that fit there, but you can make your own, right? If you have paper Absolutely. you like, you can cut it to the right size and fold it and just slide it right in and you've got a notebook. So Absolutely. It's really that's pretty nice. cool. And the leather makes it um, like, a, a, you know, an object you keep and Yeah. um, get attached to over time. Right. But the, the inserts make it infinitely reusable. Yeah, it's got the tr it's got the lasting part and then the transient part both. Yeah, it's Right. nice. Hmm. Interesting. Well, that's really cool. And I was going to go back and say you you use the thin moleskin. I'm assuming you mean the staple bound ones. Yeah, Uh, not the not the hard not bound the hard ones. bound ones. Got it. Because they they can slip in a pocket or a purse or bag or something. Yeah, because Not when so I'm bulky. traveling, you know, you know, weight matters, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. And Yep. so you just want to be able to have something on the fly. Hmm. Yep. Cool. Well, that's really great. We'll have to, uh, I'll follow up and make sure we get as many as we can in the show notes for people, the places and the tools. So you can go check them out and spend some money. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you won't regret it. yeah. People that listen to this podcast, probably I spend a lot of their money. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I would love to hear, um, some tips from you. We like to make some part of the podcast practical. And I frame it with, let's assume there's a visual thinker, whatever they are, comic book artist, sketch noter, graphic recorder, could be just someone kind of curious. Uh, and they're starting to do this, but they feel maybe they're hit, hit a plateau or they just need a little encouragement. What would be three things you would tell that person to give them a little encouragement? I guess you know, because like like you, I'm I come from writing background, and I 
tend to see people who get really, when I teach my class, I get people who are very tight about their drawing, right? Mm -hmm. Or very mm -hmm. feeling like they're not an artist and so therefore they can't draw. So I end up breaking it down into, you are just, you're writing letters and then you're learning how to write words and you're learning how to write sentences and from the sentences you get stories. And if you think mm. about it in building blocks, right? Like your letters are the straight, the curves, the circles, the shapes, mm. right? And then you put that together to make people, places, things. That's the words. And then you add conjunctions and connectors uh, or adjectives, right? Like, and that would be like arrows and boxes mm. to group mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. or like, you know, a little, little line radiating lines to show something is new or swirly lines you know to show like a different mood uh, or using t different sizes of type mm -hmm. so that's your connectors to make sentences and then when you have all of these things together then it becomes a story mm -hmm. so if you think about it like as a, a form of alphabet and writing system yeah versus thinking of it as a artistic system then you it just feels more approachable. I yeah, I think so. Yeah, it lowers the bar a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess the other thing I'll tell people, like, um, you know, like we're all stuck in boring meetings a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so sometimes I, I find that um, I'll practice my sketch notes in boring meetings. Mm. Um, and I'll, uh, you know. Not much to lose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it, it sometimes then it's, uh, you know, like the key thing, right? You write the words and then you leave space for for images mm -hmm. and then um you know it's just kind of even practice sometimes i'll draw the people in the meeting to practice drawing different facial expressions or um i'll challenge myself to draw tricky visual concepts like uh lately i've had to like i had to recently do a storyboard to illustrate uh large language models for ai mm. oh yeah that was tricky mm -hmm. uh Bit bitcoin was tricky it was the other one before um things or like AR, how I, how would I draw AR and VR experiences? Mm, mm -hmm. And so like what I did with that was um, I would draw the person with the uh, uh, VR glasses in green. The rest of the body was, you know, black and white. And mm. then I would make like a pointed, like a word balloon, but I would make it a square word balloon mm. pointing at the glass and outline in green. So what that would indicate is that this is what, what they're, they're seeing. seeing through the glasses. See. And then anything they were seeing the glasses I would draw in green as well. I see. Mm. So then in the, in the context of like separate those. Mm -hmm. So it's like kind of like there's, especially if you work in tech or anything that's abstract, like finance or, yeah. uh, or uh, like uh, healthcare, some, um, some things you're dealing with sometimes a lot of abstract concepts. So then it's, and, and these will be like your greatest hits, right? These are things that's going to come up for you over and over again. So like figure out your, your, your icon or symbol for it. Mm. Kind of like when I teach people, when I teach my class and I teach it to different, I teach to healthcare companies, tech companies, some that are more enterprise or more cloud focused, some are more custom, like retail or e-commerce focused. I teach them a basic curriculum and then I customize it, the second half for their industry. Mm. Uh, saying like, I'm not here to, you know, like Duolingo, right? Duolingo will teach me stuff like, um, my my sister teaches has teaches geology at the university, and it's like, I never use that in a sentence right. when I go to Japan, right? Yeah, I want, I'd like to order this, but could I get it with the kimchi on the side instead of this, yeah. or like, or um, how much is this, or where's the bathroom? Like practical or, things, yeah. Practical, right? So I try to, when I teach my drawing class, I go like, here's the basics and here's your greatest hits for your industry. Mm. You know, here's how to draw a shopping cart if you're in e-commerce. Here's um, here's how to draw your company logo really fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Things like that, right? So Things you're going to use a lot, yeah. So I'm always really focused, like when I mm. think of it as language learning, I try to think of it as what's the stuff you need? Because you don't need to learn how to draw everything in the world. Yeah. Just the stuff in your world. That's a great second tip. So first one is um, think of it as language. The mm -hmm. second is to build a greatest hits of the things you're going to use often using that language. I think the third one is um, 
just be visual be visual with with fun low low stakes things <laughs> yeah good good point uh like sometimes people get really bent like like oh my god if i'm gonna do scratch you know, at a conference everyone's gonna look at it and it has to be perfect right right or if i'm gonna scratch you know, at work it, it has you know every, like, everyone's gonna see it and it has to be good it's like then when i I say, well, how about sketch notes for fun, low stakes things, like mm -hmm. a favorite recipe, or um, you know, like a travel journal, mm -hmm. or um, you know, or like even sketching uh, your favorite TV show, like yeah, what that's a good one. Mm -hmm. so, so think of fun way, or I think another one is draw with your, draw with young people. Yeah. Uh, if you have your kids or uh, nieces or nephews or any young people you come in contact with, draw with them. Have fun with them mm -hmm. and uh, draw together. And you'll find that, I mean, that's how I got started. My mom trained right. me when I was young, right? <laughs> so you're, one, it makes, it invites you to enjoy it as fun. It invites you to, um, you know, play together in a, in a spirit of experimentation and low stakesness. But also kind of when, you, when you're with kids, you just kind of learn, oh, I don't need to worry about a lot of these yeah. things. Yeah. Right? Don't, don't put too much burden on yourself. Yeah. Or, or treat yourself as kindly as you would a kid. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, who's just learning how to draw. Yeah. And then that's a good idea. That's, I think so much of it gets blocked because as adults, we, you know, we, we're, we're, we judge our, we judge ourselves too harshly. Yeah. Put too much burden even, on ourselves. Yeah. For even a very beginner efforts. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, there's always a time and a place to be better, but you'll never get better if you never at least go through a lot of rounds of being not so good at it. Yeah. <laughs> right. And and being and it doesn't matter that's not so good. You're at least doing it. Right. Right. Because we, mm -hmm. we were talking about people who use AI for these kind of things. It's like you're missing the point. You're miss like the 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 true joy of the sketch only is the motor memory. Mm-hmm. The act, act, activity, the connection between your muscles and your, you know, the thing and your visual, and then it, it that be, ends up being reinforcing something in your brain. So yeah, yeah it's the drawing. I, I've taught my drawing classes through Zoom, but I find it's so much more fun if it's in person. Yeah, yeah, it's that's a tough one though. Mm. Well, those are three great tips. I. Thanks for sharing those and thank you for all that you're doing in the visual thinking community. I know attending the international sketch note camp and um, doing the teaching that you're doing. Thank you for doing that and just helping people move beyond not doing anything. That's really helpful. And I'm glad that you're doing it. So thank you for that work. Oh, thank you. I'd love to go to next year's sketch. Note. I, I have such fond memories of that one, but I said yeah. I missed the last few. Yeah. Well, it's going to be in Texas. Um, it's been announced for second through the fourth of, August in San Antonio, oh. Texas. So, you know, so Dang. it's going to be right in the neighborhood for okay. all the people in the United States. So we're, uh, Michael Clayton is running the show and I'm helping with a few other people. So uh, as we record this, it's um, late, it's early February. So pretty soon there should be more information. And of course, if you, you probably have seen on the website announcements for it by this time, by the time the show comes out, but uh, yeah, it's going to be San Antonio. So Exciting. I'll mark my calendar. <laughs> yeah. Tacos and barbecue and sketch notes. Nice. Can't go wrong. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. One thing I love about, I, I'll say, I want to say to you, Mike, that there are a lot of people who create creative communities and the creative community you've created is has such a nice feeling, just mm. a nice warm vibe of collaboration and, you know, shared growth. And so thank you for that. I, I oh, thank you. Made a great, great impact. I'm just one piece of that puzzle. There's a lot of people that invest in that. So I'm glad to hear that. And they will as well when they hear this podcast. So yeah, for sure. Well, Deb, what, what's the best place to find you? Do you have a website we can go to and see your work and reach out to you? Do you on, are you on certain social media where you hang out uh, these days? Uh, well, I'm on Blue Sky as Deb Aoki. And okay. I, I'm on um, my Twitter account is having problems nowadays mm. because Twitter, uh, but I am on Twitter at, with the manga splitting. Um, okay. And then if you go to mangasplanning.com, we that's where all our podcasts are at. Mm, okay. My I'm embarrassed to say that my my website is down right now for renovations. Oh, okay. 
But eventually, Dabaoki.com will be back. Okay, Just, maybe okay. by the time the show comes out in March or that whatever. Would, that would be a good deadline, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, there you go. I'll give you a deadline. Okay, <laughs> that's good. Even if it's just, you know, coming soon and it's a you with a hard hat on shoveling, <laughs> that would be, you know, throwback to the 90s. You know, when, <laughs> when, when websites weren't ready yet, they'd have a, like a little construction worker digging. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> they should do dev digging and animate it. And that would be your website until you get it up. <laughs> good idea. <laughs> <laughs> And then I re- need to stop every once in a while. See you soon. <laughs> That'd be funny. Um, cool. Well, we'll we'll definitely uh, send people there. We'll get the show notes from you and find them on our own as well. So if you're curious about anything here, just go to show notes and you'll find a link to it. And Deb, thanks for being on the show. It's been great to have you. Thanks for sharing your experience and your wisdom. Thank you. Thanks for and having me. It's been so me. delightful to talk with you. Yeah, you're so you're so welcome. And For anybody who's listening or watching, it's another episode of the podcast. Until the next episode, talk to you soon. The Sketchnote Army podcast was created by me, Mike Rohde, and brought to you by Rohde Design Studios. It's produced and edited by Alec Polianis of Amp Creative Studios. The theme music was created by John Schiedemeyer. To support the creation of this show, I invite you to buy one of my books, The Sketchnote Handbook or The Sketchnote Workbook. You can find the books on Amazon or... Go to peachpit.com and use the code RODI40 for 40% off. Please share this podcast with other visual thinking friends and be sure to leave a nice rating on iTunes or your favorite podcast listening app so others can find the show.